Good morning. This is Michael Leahy of the Irish Freedom Party. Our party has argued pretty much since the beginning of April that the lockdown was a gross overreaction. And our party chairperson, Professor Cahill, has given a strong scientific basis to that position, which has received international attention. We are all aware of the economic and social chaos that may result, the unforeseen consequences in terms of downstream health effects, not to mention the hollowing out of the education of our youth. These arguments are well understood, even if they have not been properly discussed by government. However, my concern in this video is to look at the potentially destructive psychological impact of what has taken place in terms of the protection of the immensely important values of human solidarity and human culture. We need to ask whether the process in which we are now engaged is one that has the potential to lead to the creation of a fascist state, perhaps even an international fascist superstate. Fascism is a term which is often used by those who wish to avoid debate and is often used incorrectly, but it was perhaps best defined by historian Professor Norman Stone some years ago when he identified its six main characteristics. Among these were the tendency to totalitarian or total government, the denial of the private life of the individual, the promotion of hate and dissension between groups within society, as well as the identification of an external threat, the breaking down of social and community bonds to the subjugation of the state, and of course the suppression of free speech and free thought. In order to promote total government, it is necessary to break down the bonds that tie people together as a society, within a community, even within that most sacred human society, the human family. Can anyone doubt that in Western culture over the past 40 years, the individual family, the basic building block of any stable society, has been aggressively attacked by all governments which style themselves as liberal? Indeed, many on the left see the destruction of the nuclear family as a prerequisite to the creation of a new world order. Many years ago I visited a Victorian prison in Britain where within the chapel each seat was divided by vertical panel so that prisoners, even in that holy setting, could not communicate one with another or smile one to another. It was brought horribly to my mind when I recently saw the proposals for children's desks at primary schools where vertical panels were to be used to ensure that children could not communicate, could not speak to another, lest they suffer infection. Do we have any idea of the horrible consequence this will have in the development of young children? The Victorian prison authorities well understood that the destruction of human solidarity was necessary to break the spirit of their captives. Our absurd excuse is that of protection of health, but it is indeed a primitive and non-holistic vision of what constitutes human health. When human solidarity and human connections are broken down, then human society will wither on the vine, and its culture comes to be replaced with the non-stop propaganda which emanates from state and other sources of power. What we witness today from the organs of the press is a shocking sameness of thought, a failure to question the deeply disturbing activities that our government is engaged in, and a universal contempt for those who try to raise serious concerns. The propaganda I mentioned quickly becomes a type of substitute culture. Is there anything more absurd than our cultural activities being reduced to people blandly going to their doors to applaud and sing at the behest of their cultural leaders in the media? Is there anything more disturbing than people taking their moral prescriptions from the professional clowns who constitute our celebrity culture? <coughs> However, given the moral confusion of some of our church leaders, this may not be so surprising. We have now moved to a situation where we are allowing police control to dictate whom we can and cannot visit, what the purpose of a private visit is, how many people we may admit to our houses. We are also aiding and abetting in the creation of the censorious informer culture on which the fascist state will always be based. Of course, many will regard this as a temporary matter. However, initial indications were that these restrictions were to be in place for a short period in order to enable hospitals to get ready. That was three months ago. We are gradually being acclimatised to a situation where there will always be some restrictions and where we are grateful to our leaders for allowing us to occasionally visit our elderly patients, parents. It is shocking that a free society has allowed itself to fall into such a path. There can be no doubt that a strong and overwhelming state force has been waiting in the wings for many years now. And now in the words of Yeats, 
it's time come round again, it slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Whether the so-called crisis was orchestrated or whether government simply took advantage of it is not really that relevant. Governments will not lightly give up the power they have now shown they can exercise over those troublesome beings, the private citizens. We have been warned by many secular prophets from the past, such as George Orwell and Alexander Solzhenitsyn, to be very wary of ceding power to the state. Both of them foresaw how a fascist state could be imposed on a free people, which ceases to jealously guard its own liberties. There is also now a huge question over the fitness of our constitutional arrangements, particularly for those countries of the European Union which have ceded constitutional prerogatives to that Union over the past two decades. It is clear that not one of the forces of our society which is meant to act as a check on the overweening power of the state has succeeded in reigning in government from embarking on a course of action which is in clear breach of recognised human rights standards and is carried out without carefully reasoned justification. Where has been the opposition in our parliaments? Where have our elected representatives been in calling public health officials to account? Where have been our upper houses? Why have our churches not pointed out the moral horror of closing places of worship, but have instead acquiesced like unpaid social workers doing the state's bidding? Where has been our media? They have failed us for so long that it is indeed correct to describe them as a propaganda arm of the authoritarian state. Where have been our higher courts? I describe this as the formation of a fascist state, but many of the actors imposing oppression upon society are not just state actors. The role of big tech, the role of universities, and indeed the role of several of our professions must also be questioned. The warning sign is always evident where there is a universal agreement on the main issues which face a society. Where there is a failure to question, a failure to object, a failure to express dissent. When that type of culture of unthinking acquiescence is allowed to prevail, the society and its freedoms will wither and die. If you think that the current crisis is temporary, <coughs> consider the extent to which fear of imminent catastrophe has been encouraged by our political classes for the past many years. Recently we heard a former Assistant Secretary of the United Nations, Mary Robinson, arguing that the post-Covid world now emerging would teach us lessons for dealing with the climate action crisis. We always seem to face a crisis, backed up by dubious and at times perverse science, which is used to justify the destruction of freedom, liberty and the individual human spirit. That is indeed the essence of the fascist state. In that sense, <coughs> it may well be that the restrictions which we have recently seen are merely a trial one for, run for what may be coming in the future. The acquiescence of the people in the current situation will undoubtedly embolden those who seek the long-term creation of the society of total government. It has long been predicted that in this election year the emergence of crises would be used to drive the American electorate into the arms of the authoritarian left. In the event that this happens, it is likely that America, and by extension Europe, can say goodbye to its liberties for a very long time. Governments throughout Europe, as well as non-governmental actors such as Big Tech, are now clamouring to restrict freedom of speech and to destroy the right to freedom of thought, because, as Orwell pointed out, that which cannot be spoken quickly becomes that which cannot even be thought. The Irish Freedom Party has consistently opposed the lockdown from three weeks after its introduction. We offer you an opportunity to become involved, to mobilise and to fight back to protect your civil and religious liberties from the attacks that are undoubtedly coming. Don't let it be said that after being warned about what was happening, you didn't do anything. Why not log on to our webpage and sign up for membership? We look forward to seeing you. This has been Michael Leahy of the Irish Freedom Party.